Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. What do I have to take care of when I do a clean installation of my PC and which tools should I install? This is a question that I hear quite frequently on Twitter and Facebook. And the reason behind that question is usually either the feeling that the system could need a fresh start or that one of you guys wants to build a PC for the very first time. So I decided that instead of just talking about this topic, I will actually do a complete clean install of my workstation and walk you through the process where I show you how I do it, which applications I use on a daily basis and how I configure them. So this video is by no means the ultimate guide to a perfect Windows installation. It's just how I do it after I've been building PCs for about 20 years now or so. As a result of that, you will surely find many comments below this video with different suggestions and tips. And that is actually a good thing, because you can use the information in this video as a starting point, but in the end you will keep tweaking your setup until you eventually arrive at a solution that works best for you and your budget. Now I've split the information in this video into several chapters so that you can access specific information quite easily, like when you come back later and just want to find that specific detail about why and how I use VoiceMeter. Sadly, I cannot provide you with annotations because, as you can see here, YouTube does not allow to use annotations together with the new end screen. Which sucks, because the new end screen is kind of essential to content creators as it works on all mobile devices. So the best I could do is add timestamp links in the description of this video, which take you directly to a specific chapter. In the description you will also find links to all applications that I show and mention in this video. The first thing we have to talk about is storage. I recommend that you install your operating system on a separate SSD or a M2 SSD if your mainboard supports it. This SSD or M2 SSD should not be smaller than 120 GB, as otherwise you might run out of space quite fast. In addition to this SSD, you also need at least one hard disk where you store all your data. Here you should go for a model with 7200 RPM and a capacity of at least 2 TB. And if you can afford it, then you should consider to add an additional SSD where you store games that benefit from the high read and write speed of a SSD. You can also use it to store your gameplay where especially tools like the XStory benefit if not demand the high performance of a SSD. Now before you start with the clean installation of Windows 10, you should better back up the data that you don't want to lose in the process. This means that you should go through your documents, downloads and other user folders and copy or move important files to a separate, maybe even an external hard drive. If you don't want to lose any of your fonts, then simply copy your entire fonts folder to your backup drive. If you use Firefox, then the Mozilla backup tool can create a backup of your entire profile, which you just have to restore later on to get a fully functional Firefox in a matter of minutes. If your email client downloads emails to your PC and stores them on the C drive, then you should also check how to backup or export your emails to avoid that you lose them during the clean installation. You really have to make sure in this step that you backup all your important data before you begin with the clean installation. Now before we start with the clean installation, we need to make sure that we don't install an outdated build of Windows 10 or outdated drivers. This is also the time where you should make sure that you have all the required product keys ready. So to ensure that I'm installing a recent build of Windows 10, I simply download the media creation tool from the Microsoft website, which then downloads Windows 10 and creates a bootable USB flash drive. When it comes to the drivers, then you should always download the latest version from the manufacturer's website. So if you have a graphics card that uses an AMD GPU, then download the driver from the AMD website. And when you have a NVIDIA graphics card, then you download the latest driver from the NVIDIA website. The same applies to the drivers of your mainboard. And if you are not sure what mainboard you have in your system, then you can use the tool CPU set, which tells you the exact model. In Windows 10, you have the option to launch a clean installation from inside the settings. But since a few of my viewers said that they want to build a PC for the very first time, I decided to do it the old fashioned way and simply boot from the USB flash drive that I just created. What I also like to do is disconnect all drives except the one where I want to install Windows on. This is a habit that I developed many years ago after the installation of Windows Vista placed the bootloader on the wrong hard disk. So what we see here are the partitions of my current Windows 10 installation, which I will delete now as I want to start clean. Now after I did that, I won't create a new partition. I simply keep the unlocated space selected and press next, which allows Windows 10 to create the required partitions on its own. Once the first installation step is done, you can select who owns and uses this PC. 
And if you prefer to use a local account instead of logging in with your Microsoft account, then you just have to skip this step and create a local account in the next screen. Once the installation is complete, I always set the PIN for my login as I don't want to type in my full password every time I must restart the PC once I installed the driver. After I set the PIN, I shut down the PC, reconnect all drives, start it again and begin with the installation of the drivers that I downloaded earlier. What I don't install are the tools that come with the main board which allow you to tweak all sorts of things. I found that when I set the fan controls inside of the BIOS, then I don't need to have these tools installed in Windows as well, but that is just how I like to do it. Also when I install or update the Nvidia drivers for my graphics card, then I always deselect the 3D Vision drivers and the audio drivers since I'm not going to use these. Once I installed all the drivers, I like to increase the text size to 125% as this puts less strain on my eyes. Then I go to computer management and change the drive letters to get my drives organized. Here you can also see the partitions that the Windows installer created after I deleted the previous installation on my Windows SSD. Then I go to system and change the name of my PC so that it becomes easier to access it from other devices in my network. After that I take care of the Windows Explorer. First of all, I want to get a confirmation dialog when I delete a file, which I can enable in the properties of the recycle bin. Then inside the Explorer I go to Options and disable the Show Recently Used options for files and folders, because I don't like how messy the quick access becomes otherwise after a few weeks. I rather add my own folders to the quick access manually. Then inside the View tab I select Show Hidden Files, Folders and Drives. I disable Hide Extension for Known File Types and I enable Expand to Open Folder and Show All Folders as that makes the navigation easier for me inside the Windows Explorer. The next thing I want to do is change how the Explorer presents me the content of a folder. For that I select the drive or folder, change the view to details and rearrange as well as resize the elements. After that I go to Options and select Apply to All Folders inside the View tab, which will cause that other folders of the same type are presented the same way as the one that I have selected at the moment. Now in the next step I will move all my use of folders away from the Windows SSD because I don't have a lot of space there. This also allows me to quickly restore my C drive without losing any of that data, but we will talk about that a bit later. Once that is done I will begin to install my essential tools. That 7-zip to extract all kinds of archives, Notepad Plus, which is great when you need to edit INI or config files, Skype, TeamSpeak and Discord, the Link Shell extension, which I will talk about later in this video, Fences from Stardock to keep the desktop organized, VLC as an all-round media player, the LAV Direct Show filters, which do not only allow the Windows Media Player to play more videos using different codecs, but also allows other applications like Adobe Premiere or Sony Vegas to edit videos that use maybe a bit more exotic codecs. VoiceMeter Banana and Virtual Audio Cables, which I use together with the XTORY to have my microphone and Voice over IP audio in separate audio tracks, the Metrox MPEG-2 codecs for the XTORY as they provide a very good quality while not creating too big files, True Image as backup software for my Windows drive, NetLimiter to stay in control of my network connection and Firefox as well as Chrome as my primary internet browsers. You can find the links to all these applications in the description down below. Now the installation of all these applications is straightforward except for the LAV filters, where you should select DXVA2 native as hardware decoder inside of the video settings and expand mono to stereo in the settings of the audio decoder. Now that I have everything in place, I can begin to restore the backups that I made earlier. So the first thing I want to do is use the Mozilla backup tool to restore my Firefox profile with just a few mouse clicks. Then I go to the fonts folder, select all fonts and install them. After that I then copy the contents of my user folders to the new ones stored on the D drive. After that I reconnect my OneDrive account and here I want to make sure that it also stores its files alongside with my other user data on the D drive instead of my C drive. If you use Dropbox or Google Drive, then these clients have the exact same option, so make sure that you place the files on D and not on C. Now let's talk about the configuration. 
Inside the GeForce Experience software I want to disable my microphone to avoid that it messes up my recordings. Inside the keyboard shortcuts menu I remove all shortcuts for features that I don't use to avoid that I activate them by accident. Then I change the record shortcuts to Shift F9 and Shift F10, which I just find easier to reach with my right hand. Then I go to the recording section where I change the path to point to my large SSD. Then I customize the recording options where I set a replay length of 10 minutes and increase the bitrate to 100 megabits per second, turn on instant replay and that's it. Now let's have a look at my audio setup. When I launch Voice Meter Banana then its user interface does not scale well because I increased the text size to 125% earlier. To change that I just have to go to the properties of Voice Meter Banana and select Disable Scaling on High DPI Settings. When I launch it again then the application window is smaller and looks nicer. Now what I will show you next will also work with the normal version of VoiceMeter. I just like to use VoiceMeter Banana as it provides a few additional options that I also need from time to time. So the next thing I want to do is go to menu and select System Tray Run at Startup because otherwise we will not have any audio until we manually start VoiceMeter. Then I go to the playback devices where the speakers are currently the default. So since the speakers are what I want to get my sound from I select them for A1 inside of VoiceMeter. And since I also have a Dolby Surround receiver connected to the digital output of my mainboard, I'm going to select the Realtek digital output for A2. So as long as the speakers are the default playback device inside of Windows, all audio will go directly to the speakers and not through voice meter. This is why we have to select the voice meter input as new default playback device inside of Windows, so that all audio from games, music players, video players, etc. first goes into voice meter before it then goes to our speakers. And since I also want to get the audio to my Dolby receiver, I click on the A2 button, so that this audio source is not only sent to the speakers on A1, but also the digital audio output of my mainboard on A2. Now to get a separate audio track for my voice over IP software I need to change the default speaker or playback device to cable input, which is the digital audio cable that I installed earlier. This configuration I then have to repeat in all my voice over IP applications that I use as otherwise they will get mixed together with the audio of the game. So now the audio coming from Skype, TeamSpeak or Discord will go to the cable input, which we select as hardware input inside of VoiceMeter. And since I do not want to hear that audio from my voice over IP software on the Dolby Surround system, I will not select A2 for this input. Now let's have a look at the configuration inside of DX Tori, which I use to record gameplay when I need better quality video than what Nvidia's Shadowplay is able to offer, or when I'm playing with friends as I then need separate audio tracks for the microphone, voice over IP and the game's audio. So inside the audio tab I select cable input for the first audio channel, which is then used for the incoming audio of Skype, TeamSpeak and Discord. Then I add a second audio channel where I select my microphone input as source. And lastly I add a third audio channel where I select voice meter input, which is the audio from the game. So inside voice meter I am now able to control which audio sources you can hear on the speaker or the digital audio out or both. And I also have full control over the volume and a few other aspects of the audio from these sources. Additionally, DXTory will record video files with three different audio tracks. In the first one I get just the audio from the voice over IP software that I use to communicate with my friends. The second one contains just the audio from my microphone. And in the third audio track I only get the audio from the game which makes it extremely easy to edit such a video later on. Now let's finish the configuration of DXTory. Inside the videos tab I select the Matrox MPEG-2 iframe codec which creates relatively small yet high quality videos while not putting too much stress on your CPU. Inside the codec's properties I then select a bitrate of about 250 megabits per second and select 60 as frame rate and I do the same for the frame rate option inside of DXTory. Then inside the hotkey settings I change the start stop movie capture to shift plus 11 and the screenshot function to shift plus F12 which puts them right next to the hotkeys assigned to Nvidia's Shadowplay. Then I head over to the folder setting and add a folder on my SSD where I want the XTORI to store the video files. And to make sure that everything is working correctly I run a quick benchmark. Also since I'm using the screenshot function inside of the XTORI I will have to add a folder where I want to store these pictures. And lastly the overlay settings. 
I like to have the FPS counter in the top center of the screen. And when I start a recording, then I want it to be displayed in red. So maybe you've noticed that I'm the kind of person who likes to keep things organized, which is why I'm using fences from Stardock. One of its nice features are folder portals, which you can create by holding down the right mouse button. After that, you select a folder that you want to get displayed inside of the portal on your desktop, like your downloads folder. You can also change the view inside of the folder portal, and when you delete the file here, then it's also gone inside of the downloads folder. So this is a nice way to quickly access the contents of a folder from your desktop without actually moving the folder to your desktop, which I should never do. Now let's have a look at NetLimiter, which is one of the most important tools for me. The first thing that you want to do is enable show tray icon, minimize to tray and close to tray, as otherwise you will not get any pop-up notifications from the firewall if you decide to use it. Speaking of the firewall, you should also enable firewall in and firewall out inside of the activity options so that you can see which firewall rules are applied to an application. Inside NetLimiter, you can then switch to only display the applications that are currently online. So when I start to play a video inside of YouTube, then NetLimiter will show me how much bandwidth is currently used by Google Chrome. It shows me all the IPs that it connected to, and if I want, then I can also set a limit for the downstream or upstream bandwidth. So with NetLimiter, it's very easy to identify how much bandwidth is used by an application, to which IPs it connected to, and you can also limit how much bandwidth the application is allowed to use. In addition to these very useful features, it also includes a firewall with which you can either allow or deny internet or LAN access on a per application basis. So what I like to do is set the firewall rule to ask for the internet zone in both the in and out directions. When an application then tries to establish an outgoing connection or when there's an incoming connection, then NetLimiter allows you to set if you want to allow this connection or not. You can also select to permanently remember this rule for that application or to only apply this rule for a little while. You can also directly change and set firewall rules manually. For most applications, you will simply choose remember and allow as you usually want that Firefox, Chrome, etc. can always access the internet. But when some strange software manages to sneak onto your PC, then this firewall can be very helpful as it avoids that that application can download data without you noticing. So now that I have installed and configured all the drivers and the essential tools, we want to make sure that we didn't miss something. For that, we go to the device manager. And when it looks like this, then everything is okay, which means that it's time to check if Windows Update has some updates left that need to be installed. Now, while it's downloading and installing the updates, I want to quickly go to the advanced options, where I select give me updates for other Microsoft products when I update Windows, like for Microsoft Office, and sign in automatically to finish setting up my device after an update, which speeds up the process of installing updates. After the installation and the restart of the PC, I then open the Windows Explorer and rename my C drive to OS, because that's what it's used for. Then I go to the properties of my C drive and select clean up to remove files that are no longer needed. So now I have installed and configured all drivers and the essential tools. This means that if anything happens to my Windows installation in the near future, then this is a point that I would like to return to without completely reinstalling the system again. To achieve that, I use true image to create an image of my Windows SSD. And since all my user data is stored on D, I can quickly restore this image and go back to the state without losing that data. However, before you restore your image, you will still have to back up your fonts and data from other applications that might store their data on C. But if that is important data, then you should have a separate backup plan for that anyway. Now let's install some games. If you plan on downloading games from the Windows Store, then you should change the drive inside of the storage settings because your Windows SSD is not the right place to store games that have 20 GB or even more. Steam, Battle.net, Origin and Uplay should also not be installed on your Windows SSD. I always place them on my hard disk. Inside the configuration of these clients, I then also change the default download and installation directory to make sure that all of my games end up on the big hard disk and not on the Windows SSD. A nice feature that Steam, Origin, Battle.net and Uplay support is that they don't try to re-download a game when the files are already on your hard disk. Steam and Battle.net will automatically show you these games as installed, while in Origin and Uplay you have to press download and then the client will check the files that are already there. So in the worst case you have to download a patch that was released in the meantime. 
So now I have all my games installed on my hard disk. But what if there is a game that could really benefit from a fast SSD? This is where the link shell extension comes into play, which makes it very easy to move a game to a SSD without breaking anything. Let me show you this with Overwatch. First I want to make sure that Battle.net is not running. Then I go to the installation directory, select the Overwatch folder and choose Cut. Then I go to my fast SSD and move the Overwatch folder here. Now right click on the Overwatch folder and select Pick Link Source. Then I go back to the original folder, right click and select Drop as Symbolic Link. So as far as the operating system and Battle.net are concerned, Overwatch is still installed on E, while in fact the data is stored on the fast SSD. This method allows you to very very easily relocate pretty much any folder you want without breaking the game or the client. If you use Adobe products then you should go to the settings inside of the Creative Cloud app before you install any of the applications. Make sure that you have the correct app language selected as otherwise you have to re-download the entire application again after you change it. Also change the installation location to point to your hard disk to avoid that the applications end up on your Windows SSD. And lastly change the folder location for your Creative Cloud Files folder to point to the same place where you also store all your user files so that you have all that data in one place. Once I installed all my Adobe applications I then launch After Effects and go to Preferences, Media and Disk Cache. For the disk cache I then change the folder to C, Temp, Adobe, AE and for the media cache I choose C, Temp, Adobe, Common. So the files still end up on the C drive, but this location makes it easier for me to have an eye on how much disk space they eat up on the drive. Also Premiere and Media Encoder automatically use this path now, so you only have to set it once. Now after you installed all your applications and games your desktop will probably look something like this. If you are the kind of person who uses shortcuts on a desktop to launch an application, then you can use fences to clean this up. Just hold down the left mouse button to create a new fence. And if you like then you can also give it a name. You can also hide all these fences with a double click of your left mouse button. And it's even possible to exclude specific elements from that hide function. Now which antivirus software do I use? As I said in one of my previous videos I only use the Windows Defender that is part of Windows 10 and my brain. Because the most expensive antivirus software will not help you when you visit shady websites or when you blindly open every email attachment that you receive. Also think twice when an application asks you for admin permissions, especially when it is a PDF file that you just tried to open. The reason why I set the Windows Explorer to never hide file extensions is so that I cannot fall into this trap here. What we got here looks like two PDF files, right? Which one do you think is not a real PDF? Well, maybe the second one because that does look a bit suspicious. Well, not quite, because none of them is a real PDF file which you can see once I disable hide extension for known file types. This is why I should always disable that option inside of the Windows Explorer. What also helps you to keep your PC safe is the firewall that is built into NetLimiter, because when you have that enabled then you will get notified when a strange application tries to access the internet, which can already prevent further damage as it is unable to download additional harmful software. So at this point I got a Windows 10 installation where most of my user data, applications and games are stored on the hard disk rather than the Windows SSD. DxTory creates video files of my gameplay that contain three different audio tracks, one for the voice over IP audio, one for my microphone audio and one for the audio of the game. I can see which application accesses the internet, I can limit the bandwidth an application is allowed to use and I can even block individual applications from accessing the internet or the local network. And when my Windows installation breaks in the future then I can revert to a working state in a matter of minutes thanks to the image that I created from my Windows SSD. So as I said in the beginning of this video I do not claim that this is the only or the best way to install and configure your PC. It's just what I arrived at after many years of building my own PCs. So I hope that this video contains some information that you find helpful and if you like this kind of niche content that I release on my channel then you can support me through Patreon. The link is in the description below where you can also find the timestamps for all the sections of this video as well as the download links for the applications that I showed in this video. Also if you want to know what I'm currently working on then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook, the links are also in the description down below. 
If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.